Hello to all of you. Dispersed in this hot summer day, I also drove six hours from Switzerland and I'm a little bit exhausted. That's why I hope that you help me a little bit. Of course, it's a no pressure announcement. The future is coming. Um, well, I thought rather than, let's say, talking big words and so on, I come from the um, imaging neuroscience community. And that's why I thought I'll bring you a little bit of know-how on this. Because you're coming here on this workshop, you're sacrificing a beautiful day, or you could be somewhere at the swimming pool. And I think um, you have to take something from this workshop, right? In terms of knowledge, in terms of perspective. That means two-thirds of my, my talk will be more what can we learn about the brain using non-invasive brain imaging, and the last third will be about the medical informatics platform. There I would refer to my colleague uh, Ferhat Kerif, who will be talking much more in depth about uh, this platform tomorrow. Right, I know a few faces here, only one, and the rest, who does research in humans? Just raise your hand. In humans, one, two. And in animals? The rest, I guess. And the rest? In humans. Okay, good. Uh, well, as you introduced me very uh, nicely, uh, my background is clinical. That means I'm not that scientific. And I'll bring you my perspective. You had already two lectures on movement disorders. This is indeed one of the cities with the experts worldwide. You had Werner Pöwe, you had uh, Professor Wenning. That means uh, you had already a load of information. I'll bring you not that much the clinical perspective. I'm going to talk about brain imaging. Good, let's start. Do you know these two fellas? Who are they? Exactly. <laughs> Good, the one is uh, unfortunately not among us anymore, but um, I like this picture because it gives you exactly this idea, although we heard there is hope, at least for migraines. Um, neurodegenerative disorders are, we are hitting a wall there. Um, there are many different issues. I have a different perspective in terms of drug development. I think we failed, clinicians, um, not you. Um, but um, you see these this two uh, chaps affected by this disorder are still hopeful and they want to fight uh, for it. Good. You heard, I'm sure, about the core problem in Parkinson's disease for some unknown reasons. Uh, reason, the cells in the so-called substantia nigra, the black substance, the dark substance, are decreasing and they die and the, 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 the neurotransmitter dopamine, which is produced there, is not enough to maintain a certain normal brain function. Of course, with aging, let's say healthy aging, him and me, we are also uh, losing these cells. But Parkinson's disease patients are losing this more abruptly. And what is most important, let me see where is the laser, it should be there, it doesn't work. Um, most importantly, up to the moment, when a movement disorder specialist, Professor Perve, sees very subtle signs in a patient, 70% up to this point of the substantia nigra cells are already gone. That means we have a problem. I think this is, was his, his, his um, uh, main point today when he was talking about prodromal Parkinson's disease. Thank you. Was to uh, say that we have indeed to detect this preclinical phase when the cells are already dying but the patient has not developed the disorder, which again makes absolutely necessary that in different population, let's say us, we try to stratify homogeneous groups, be it based on genetic bio, uh, markers or other biomarkers, we need this in order to establish this preclinical diagnosis. That means people at risk, either genetic or other env environmental, etc., 
We need to detect these people before the clinical signs are there because it's absolutely clear the brain has enormous capacity to compensate a certain loss of structure and function. That means when the patient goes to the doctor, then it's already too late for people like the speaker before me to develop neuroprotective tracts and so on. Good, and that's clear. That's the new uh, trendy word, this patient-tailored uh, uh, treatment. Because, of course, we are creating some smart drugs, but we are even more smarter with some genetic features of an individual. We can minimize adverse effects and, and achieve better, um, better um, clinical results, better clinical outcome. Okay, I hope also that you learn today, particularly for movement disorders, Parkinson's disease, etc. You don't need to make any brain imaging. It's a clinical diagnosis. Our experience is enough to say, okay, somebody is shaking, somebody is walking with small steps, etc., etc. There is a certain rigidity in the muscles, increased muscle tone. That's Parkinson's disease in the majority of cases. Sometimes imaging is done because we see some vascular changes. There is a certain vascular form of Parkinson's disease. That means little strokes are uh, touching the brain in some strategic portions and people have the so-called lower body Parkinsonism, just the walking is not good. An uh, experienced clinician can notice this, but it's good to have the confirmation about this. And of course, if we are not sure if it's the, let's say, idiopathic, normal part, um, version of Parkinson's disease, we're doing some nuclear uh, medicine type of exam when we're looking at some uh, dopamine transpo uh, transporter uh, receptors at the basal ganglia level. So far, so good. That means we are trying in our type of research in Parkinson's disease to use such techniques, structural functional imaging, in order exactly to fulfill this goal that what I was talking about before, to understand the mechanisms of this disease in order to detect patterns even in the normal awake or sleepy population. Good. What are the methods that we are using? Previously, what people did, they were doing um, scans of the human brain and then there was a certain region of interest and then with a shaky hand they were trying to delineate this structure because you see there is a certain difference in contrast. This is here more gray than here the white. And knowing the slice thickness of the images, because this is all something that you can, um, let's say, estimate when you scan the patients, let's say one millimeter, you can stack such a volume of surfaces and estimate the volume of a particular structure. Nowadays, this is very time consuming and of course biased by let's say, individual motivation or, or good sight, etc. Nowadays, this is done by computers. Um, we can very reliably, based on a simple structural three-dimensional scan of the brain, estimate the cortical thickness. If it's thinner in blue or thicker in red, in millimeters. We can estimate some local gray matter volumes. We can estimate, sorry for the mix of languages, but I'm also with all <laughs> possible languages at the lower level, that's why, excuse me. Um, we can estimate also the connectivity of the brain with certain methods, either just for the purpose of picture, some colorful spaghettis, or other much more in-depth um, uh, information uh, about brain structure. And the most important part, we are not looking at the images like a radiologist. That means for us, images are something more abstract. It's a matrix of numbers. What we treat with statistical methods, be it mass univariate or multivariate methods, are three-dimensional matrices. We are treating numbers. We are using proper statistical methods in order to understand what's going on, to see in the pictures what the human eye cannot see. Good, some examples. Again, the benefit of having um, uh, initiatives like the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging in initiative or the Parkinson's progression markers initi initiative, which is actually supported by uh, 
Michael J. Fox. These are big initiatives with lots of data which are accessible to all of you. You can download this data, enter it available, open source methods, analyze this data, compare results with others and so on. This is, for example, one of the strategy of our medical informatic platform of the Human Brain Project to use also such open source data in particular diseases. Again, for Alzheimer's disease and for Parkinson's disease, they're pretty similar from their design. The quality of the data is exceptional and it's very informative. For example, when we look here at 500 patients and 400 controls, we definitely see that in the parts of the brain, the motor cortex, which is responsible for controlling all the movements in the, of the patients, we have a loss of gray matter volume, what I was talking about before, in groups of Parkinson's patients with left-sided, because it's asymmetric, or right-sided Parkinson's symptoms compared with controls. Again, a very simple proof of concept that there is a certain atrophy in crucial parts of the brain. Again, if we go further, this is a small study that I had with a colleague of mine. He was collecting data along three years. That means between the first and the second scan of a patient, there was a time of three years that passed, and we see a much broader picture, certain network, which is progressively affected. That means here we have the difference between analysis of cross-sectional data, what I was showing you before, and here we have the dynamics, what's happening in within three years in a cohort with much more advanced Parkinson's patients than, than controls. I don't want to come here in details because we were interested. There are these two different phenotypes in Parkinson's disease, the very rigid one that are not moving too much, which have a worse clinical outcome, and the ones that are more tremulous, they have a more benign cause of disease. And we see indeed in these crucial parts of the brain that are responsible for decision making, for motor control, also a differential uh, impact on brain structure. So far so good. One of the problems that appeared, because this is a technique, it's called voxel-based morphometry, that means based on these three-dimensional data sets, I'm estimating features that I'm calling gray matter volume, then in, with the statistical methods I'm looking for certain correlations with clinical markers and so on and so on. The problem of all this is the neurobiological interpretation because we're making a scan of the, uh, of, the, of the brain, we are seeing some differences between gray matter and white matter. We say this is going up, this is going down. But if we want to understand what's the neurobiological substrate of all this, what is going on there? Is it myelin changing? Is it um, uh, neuronal population disappearing? We cannot give this answer. And therefore, um, I think it's important um, exactly what, um, how I was introduced to look um, um, a, a little bit more to the future. And here, actually, um, we work very closely with MRI physicists because this is the, these are the people who understand the nature of the signal that we're acquiring on our MRI machines. And already a while ago, there is, for example, a very clear relationship between histological measurements, for example, of iron concentration in the brain and a particular signal here, which is called transversal relaxation rate of the signal. That means here I have a very clear idea, if I can measure this with my MRI machine, what's the content of iron within a volume of the brain. The same appears also to be true for the myelin content. We are able now to create such individual maps of intracortical myelin, and you see the distribution of myelin in sensory motor areas, visual areas, and auditory areas is exactly what we know from Paul Flexic from the 20s of the uh, previous century. That means here, indeed, we are making a step forward to claim that we are doing in vivo histology with MRI. That's very important, I think, to take as a, as a, as a, as a, as a take-home message.
that nowadays we try to escape from this description of uh, um, this description just of volumes and thickness and so on. We are trying to quantify what we are measuring. Of course, we are limited somewhere with our techniques. We can measure myelin, we can measure iron, and we can me measure tissue water. Of course, you may say, but your resolution is at its best 800 microns. And for an axon I need, or a cell, I need three to five microns. Of course, there we are able, with existing biophysical models, to make this bridge. I'll be talking about this a little bit later. That means, in a clinically feasible situation, we are able to acquire data between 10 and 20 minutes, and then calculate afterwards these different maps which are telling us something about the content of myelin, of iron, and tissue water. We call this synthetic maps because this is not what the machine is producing. These are the results of calculation afterwards which are exactly based on a certain biophysical model. And here you see in this, for example, transfer relaxation rate uh, image, the R2 star map, the structure of the pallidum. This is the iron richest structure of the brain. We don't know why, but some of the cells in this pallidum has even more, uh, have even more iron than uh, the kupfer cells in, in the liver. Extraordinary. Nobody knows why. I have asked people, anatomy specialists on the basal ganglia, why are we accumulating iron? Also in the normal case, not in the case of neurodegeneration, nobody knows. Good. Now, first, the first question to us when we were so uh, hopeful to claim that we are doing in vivo histology was to link our results to previous techniques. And here we were linking our type of imaging with this voxel-based morphometry, this estimation of gray matter volumes, or cortical thickness. Because we were asking ourselves, okay, when I have the knowledge, what is the particular contribution of iron, of myelin, of tissue water, can I play these three elements, what I'm actually putting here up, to create synthetic images, what people elsewhere are working with to estimate these gray matter volumes and cortical thickness and to see what's the unique contribution of this. To make a long story short, I'll give you the example. Just focus on this graph here. Um, this is the effect of age on brain structure, age 15 to 95, and here estimation of gray matter volume loss. This is the true estimation of volume loss in this part of the putamen, and this is what previous techniques were telling us. The difference, where does it come from? Actually, the difference comes from accumulation of iron in this very spot of the brain. The more iron is accumulating with age, the, more, the less contrast between gray and ma white matter. Our smart algorithms are reading this change in contrast as shrinkage of this structure, but actually it's the iron that accumulates and fools us in our interpretation of how there is a lot uh, of, of, of loss, but actually it's much more, let's say, this tissue property change rather than uh, shrinkage of, of the volume. Okay, this is particularly important, these tissue properties for, for the structures of the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia, I put them here in color, uh, are the caudate, the, the putamen, uh, and the pallidum, also some others, I'll describe them. The problem is that they have this high iron content. What on the usual T1-weighted imaging that we use for our smart estimations of thickness and of, of volumes, they are, they are barely uh, to be detected, particularly the thalamus, which is a structure here, it's not formerly part of the basal ganglia, is not to be distinguished from the basal ganglia, uh, from the white matter. And in order to, um, to, to optimize this, because for these estimations of different structures, where is cortex, where is basal ganglia, and so on, 
uh, we work in a Bayesian framework. That means we use existing a priori information. And in order to make this uh, prior information uh, work for us, um, we, we, we created a little bit of a crowdsourcing uh, concept. We put a lot of images from 100 subjects, of course, and un anonymized, etc., on the web. And we, wa we ask people to, to detect structures on this. I mean, these were medical students. And in this way, everybody was tracing his favorite or her favorite structure. And we were able to create such atlas information, very detailed, on the parts of the brain which, was a little bit, which were a little bit lost in previous times. And using this type of imaging, for example, in a smaller cohort now, just 50 patients, we were able, in a whole brain analysis, because we are not restricting our analysis just to this part of the brain or that part of the brain. In our case, we do analysis of the whole brain. And for example, when we make a simple comparison between these 50 patients and 80 controls, we see that there is an iron increase where? Well, in the substantia nigra, of course, you see it. We saw also some myelin changes here in uh, some cortical motor areas, but just to show you the power of this approach without any restriction of I wish that I find changes there and there, we are able to show also certain uh, brain tissue changes which were known already from uh, invasive post-mortem, obviously, studies. Now we are having a, a, a big problem, actually, because suddenly um, we have many, many features that we are measuring per brain. Previously, we had one feature, either measure of gray matter volume or cortical thickness, but nowadays we can measure or project certain values on the surface of the brain. We can measure tissue properties along fiber tracts. And of course, the old good volume estimation, either the level of the voxel, which in our case is either 800 microns by 800 by 800, the one by one by one millimeter, or some regional measures of, of the brain. And not only this, but if you look at the various features that we are extracting, we have measures of myelin content or indicative for myelin content, tissue water, iron, then some measures of water protons diffusion, I'll talk about this, but also some more sophisticated uh, measures, how the axons are dispersed, etc. Again, all this, not a bene, is something that is based on model. We cannot image directly um, these um, features in the brain. And I'll give you a glimpse how we use this uh, in vivo histology approach. For example, we were asking ourselves, what happens with the human's white matter, or these cables running up and down uh, during uh, the lifespan? Um, this is the type of, of approaches that we develop. We separate the cortex in 333 little parcels, very randomly. And then we estimate all the connections between them with a technique called uh, tractography based on diffusion-weighted imaging. I'll introduce it in a, in, a, in a second. And then we say, OK, show us the 5% strongest connections within the brain across all these different patches of the cortex. And then estimate for each of these pathways, for each one of these different histological measures, either the age that they peak or the value which is at peak, and a certain estimate of dynamics over the lifespan. I'll repeat it again. We are doing this tractography here across the brain from each patch to, to the others. We threshold at 5%, the 5% strongest connections. This is something which is established, is known as the human connectome showing, let's say, some common features between all of us. And then along each pathway, we are sampling these uh, measures of myelin, iron, etc. Of course, we were looking at more 
these are details, but um, in the brain there are some crossing fibers. That means we were looking, are such crossing fibers going to contribute too much to the variability of, the, of the, our measures? We showed just only one measure. This is um, stays FA for fractional anisotropy, again, at water protons diffusivity measures. You see the variability of values along this track. The others are more or less homogeneous. And when we estimated all this, of course, we were doing some, um, uh, some, some estimation of or fitting different um, um, curves or different models from linear to highly nonlinear models. But more or less, for all these metrics, um, um, quadratic or cubic uh, model was explaining best uh, the results. And when we look at different measures, we, sh we see a certain um, change of these metrics, like a myelin, etc., as a function of age, which is very nice. But the question was, if in a certain simple way, after, for example, a principal component analysis, we summarize the information. What do we see? And to our surprise, this is purely data-driven approach. Actually, when we summarize this dynamics of the different uh, tissue property changes over the lifespan, we saw that they cluster in five spatial domains. And strangely enough, these five spatial domains were more or less overlapping with known functional systems. Take this one. This is the limbic system with the hippocampus, with the temporal lobes, etc. That means the brain, the human brain, white matter, is aging in five different ways. And these five different ways are spatially constrained to certain functional systems. That means we can claim that maybe the brain is so susceptible to Alzheimer's disease because this is one of the spatial modes that ages differentially than the others. There are interesting details here, but I don't want to bother you with, uh, with more anatomy knowledge. And of course, people who like these estimates of functional connectivity derived from resting state functional data, we saw also a substantial overlap between our five modules and known uh, modes of, for visual, somato, uh, sensory, etc function, derived from functional scans. Then we did a lot of work also to parcelate the, 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 the human brain cortex. We derived such beautiful maps, um, again, based on, uh, on, on more than 500 subjects, which are showing us the differential properties of the human cortex. Um, again, I don't want to go in details here because this is going uh, far too much. But just to conclude this section, our, of course, final goal is to make the link to the true histology. Um, and we're using um, a certain clinical phenomenon, which is um, epilepsy, temporal uh, lobe epilepsy. Um, and um, the majority of these cases are refractory to, to drug treatment. And the best treatment is that the surgeon cuts part of the brain that is uh, inducing this uh, abnormal seizure activity. This is something well established, and I'm truly convinced that it helps patients. But what we did is actually, before surgery, we make a surface model of the brain. The surgeons tell us where they want to cut. Knowing where they want to cut, we create such a 3D print of the part of the brain that is going to be resected because the brain is actually like jelly. If the surgeon cuts it and put, puts it on the plate, then it, it falls down. Then we have difficulties when uh, we want to um, use this together with our MRI data. That means having this 3D print of the part of the brain that is to be cut, we go to the surgeon. We do beforehand, of course, the MRI. The surgeon cuts the part of the brain, puts it in this mold, and in this way, is it the piece of the brain is as if 
it was actually not resected. And then we do a very long, very high resolution imaging. Afterwards, the tissue is fixated. There is immune histochemistry done, uh, notably for myelin, et cetera, et cetera. And the goal here is indeed in the same statistical framework to estimate at the lower level correlation between what we claim to see in the MRI and what a histologist can see with his or her method of immunohistochemistry or microscoping, etc. Good. Um, I was talking a lot. Of course, you can interrupt me. I mean, I don't know how, how, how much um, power you have for questions, but if anything is unclear, please uh, stop me and ask. I heard already beforehand you were interrupting. I'm, I'm also happy that you say, tell us. Um, Diffusion-weighted imaging is um, one of the techniques which is also existing since ages. Uh, it's something well known. For example, we're not going to do this. In a glass of water, if we put a drop of wine, of course, as a function of time, it will dissolve. And this is this constraint free motion of molecules when they don't have any membranes or something that, that will constrain their diffusion. Um, diffusion weighted imaging is making um, virtue exactly of these properties uh, and um, actually it's absolutely clear if the axons are having their membranes the diffusion will be not like this here constraint free it will be much easier along the axis of the axons and exactly this is what uh, this technique is sensitive for for the diffusion direction and the diffusion magnitude of water molecules uh, protons and of course there are different models again i was talking always about models models but indeed the richness of information of mri is that it is working based on stable biophysical models that are linked to tissue properties. Also here, um, I'm showing one of the simplest models. It's a tensor model of diffusion that gives us also an information about the main directionality of diffusion within a pixel or a voxel of a brain. And then in this way, we can see for parts of the brain where in which direction the fibers are running and in this way we can create such beautiful colorful maps of the brain um, which are color coded in such a way that blue is up down green is front back and red is left right the only problem here is that we don't know if they're running from left to the right or from the right to the left there is no directionality information well, it would be helpful, right? Good. Um, this, these images are beautiful, indeed. The question is, what's the, informa what, what's the informational content that they are, they are bringing us? I mean, you see, you can, you can make some movies. They look like sort of hairy animals. You can zoom in, what I was doing before. But you can also reduce the information to these strongest connections. What I was telling you before, this notion of the connectome, the principled way how our brains are connected. Indeed, if you reduce the information to this 5% most frequent or most strongest uh, connections, you will see that our brains will be pretty similar. And um, we tried actually to, to, to bring this knowledge into a little bit of more uh, detailed um, investigation of the Basal ganglia, okay. What this technique is, is very good for is for topological information. And there was some um, previous studies from 2003 where they show in part of the brain, in the center of the brain called thalamus, I was talking about this before, that all these different parts of the cortex project in a certain way to this part of the brain. And then you can in this uh, way uh, create a map of the thalamus, individual thalamus, how it connects to different portions of the cortex. And this is extremely important because if we're talking about 
not only Parkinson's disease, but movement disorders. There are at least 10 in my mind. Um, this cortical subcortical uh, circuits are very important. These are very complicated structures. You see it here outlined um, because there is a certain projections from the cortex to the input stations, then information is transferred further. There are at least three different ways. They're called direct pathway, indirect pathway, hyperdirect pathway. As I was a, a medical student, I hated this. I never understood it. Later on, it came. Um, but the, 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 the crucial point is actually this principle of organization. That means information is conveyed from the cortex to this little clusters of neuronal cells in the middle of the brain. Then they have a very important information to in, uh, a role to integrate, but also to segregate this information. You see it here. We have here some, let's say, motivational, emotional content. Here we have associative, that means more cognitive content. Here sensory motor. And they are pretty much well separated on the surface of the brain, in the cortex. But then there is a certain way how in a convergent or a divergent way, the information is mixed in a very sensible proportion then to come back to the cortex. Um, people say the basal ganglia is something like a principal component analysis of information because the cortex has so much information. At that moment, I'm talking, I'm looking to your reactions, I'm walking, etc., etc. And all this can be only possible if the information is really uh, partitioned, simplified, features reduced, that I can, in such a way, in a palatable way, make my decision how to react, to get bored or to be more, um, let's say, motivated, seeing that you're not falling asleep, and so on and so on. That means this is, this is, this is a, a, a fascinating, actually, mechanism. Many people try, and to, try to understand all the details of, 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 of functioning of these cortical subcortical loops, but it's not that possible. I just wanted to show you um, uh, um, some work that we did with Ferrat a while ago. We're trying to map this topography of connections between the cortex and the basal ganglia. We use this diffusion um, uh, weighted imaging, and then from each of these little Lego bricks, this, these voxels within these basal ganglia structures, we were trying to trace their pathway to the different parts of the cortex and in that way to make the mapping of this basal ganglia. Then we use some ordering with humming distance. This is not that important. But what we see actually for this basal ganglia, this is the caudate, putamen, and pallidum. I color-coded it. This is the front of the brain and this is the back of the brain. And you see a certain gradient, which you might say is logical. If I have in the middle of the brain some small structures, of course, the more um, frontal part of these structures will be uh, connected to the frontal parts of the brain. And the more I go to the back, the more the, the, um, more the back parts of the brain will be connected to it. This is something that we know from rodent studies, but we could show this also here. There's also a cer certain level of detail. I don't want to enter into it, but all the details that I'm showing in color coding are known also from histological studies. Now, the question was very simple that we posed. What is actually the role of the basal ganglia even at, at the structural level for this integration and segregation of information? Because up to then, neither on the functional side nor on the structure, it was clear what exactly is going on there. That means we have very simple question, either different type of information, let's say motivational, sensory motor, cognitive, is running in separate channels, just being looped through relays, or within this relays, there is a certain integration of information. We use some very simple maths, here with, with, with some um, uh, 
uh, Boolean logical end, we were asking, for example, for this structure, which is called putamen, which are the voxels that are projecting both to one part of the surface of the brain, but also to the next station. Here, which ones are projecting to this, to this, and to this. That means in that way, we could indeed derive a map of connectivity for these cortical subcortical loops, and you see the color coding corresponds to the different parts of the, of the cortex, of the surface of the brain. That means if you take here the blue one, this is the motor cortex, you see throughout all these different uh, stations, these are the input stations, the putamen and caudate, the information goes to here, to the pallidum, then via thalamus, it goes back to the very same structure, and you see which are the parts of this basal ganglia that convey this information. And at the same time, there was a study done with um, tracing, that means injection of, of, of certain traces uh, in the cortex of non-human primates, exactly in the same regions that we were investigating. And I tried, let's say, to do the same type of, of, of representation as they did. And you see there is uh, a stunning um, overlap in, 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 in terms of representation of the different cortical regions on this basal ganglia. And much more important, I think it's very speculative, but um, this is what we actually proposed um, as a mechanism based on the structural data also in the functional domain. You see that some parts of the brain, for example, for this red part of the cortex, I have uh, a region here in the basal ganglia which is red, but then the other half of this red overlaps already with the next part, with the yellow part. This is the, the, the part of the, of, the, of the cortex which is uh, responsible for cognition. And what we say, well, this is exactly how the basal ganglia function. Motivation from this red part of the brain, this is the orbitofrontal cortex, through this overlap with the next uh, projection, this is the cognitive part, motivation, is going to be transferred such information to cognition. Cognition comes uh, and transfers information to the planning of an action. And then planning, this is the green part here, which corresponds to projection to the premotor cortex, overlaps with the blue part that I said is the motor cortex. That means planning is transmitted to action. Motivation. I have a motivation to do something, I think about it, is it going to be good or bad for me? Then I start planning it and I execute the, the, the movement. There are other information about some loops and so on and so on. I don't want to bother you with you. But with this technique to show you how powerful it is, we are able even to see the projections in these little parts of the brain. They are small like lentils. This is the so-called subthalamic nucleus, which is actually the target for deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease. I hope Professor Pöver was talking about this today. This is the way we can alleviate up to 70 and more percent of individuals' medication, Parkinson's disease, advanced, needing a lot of drugs in order to have a certain quality of life. When we introduce this electrode and then stimulate with a high frequency, then the patient can either completely or up to 70% reduce the medication for a certain amount of time. It's a magic if you see it. On YouTube, there are certain videos. You see a banjo playing Parkinson's patient before the stimulation, can barely touch his banjo. They switch on the electrodes, and suddenly he's a master as he was 20 years ago. Um, um, and, and, and here the, the, the relevant point is that we can separate in this small structure the limbic part, which is more related to emotions, from the motor part. Because the surgeon wants actually to target this motor part. If I'm too close to the yellow part, to the limbic part, then there are a lot of adverse events. Parkinson's patients become either very excited or unfortunately commit suicide, etc. That means 
This is additional information derived from imaging research for the benefit of patients. We have done some work here, but I don't want to bother you. Again, a mix between this technique with the diffusion imaging and other imaging techniques, magnetoencephalography. I'm not going to talk about this um, if you're not that much interested. And this is exactly what we are doing now uh, in, 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 in the case of patients previewed for such deep brain stimulation. We take the image of the brain with these techniques. We are estimating the probability intra-individually um, of um, 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 having projections to th these different parts of the brain. And we give this information to the neurosurgeon that the neurosurgeon knows in this patient, I have to be more to the left, to the right, etc. Good. Um, one last part, because I was talking up to now about structural imaging. Here I'm going to mention something about functional imaging, also something very nice um, that is giving us indirect information about neuronal activity. Indirect, and not measuring neuronal activity. This is a very um, nice slide um, that shows you indeed um, it's shown already back in the 90s, this mapping of the brain, functional mapping of the brain. If, for example, I wiggle with, with, with the left hand, it will be the right motor cortex, which will be uh, uh, active. If I touch your feet, it will be the sensory motor, uh, sensory cortex, which will be active. If I start talking, it will be the so-called Broca area active. These are, let's say, simple uh, uh, paradigms that were done a while ago and people are convinced that the technique delivers well. If, for example, I cause you pain, there is a whole network uh, for pain perception which will be active. This is done at the individual level but also um, in uh, uh, groups of, of subjects. Of course, if I'm looking at something, it will be the visual cortex here, the back of the brain, which will be active. The principle is all also known it's about the differential sensitivity of the type of imaging that we're using in MRI. This is different type of imaging than the two types that I was showing you before uh, to oxygenated and desoxygenated blood. It's about the um, uh, speed of the spins uh, of, of the protons, uh, which is different. And more or less, um, this is the basic principle. Parts of the brain which are more active need more oxygen and will have also more desoxygenated blood. And this is what uh, actually uh, makes the signal difference. Um, then I'll bring this, um, let's say, notion of functional imaging in uh, the concept of, again, integration of segregation uh, of inf information. The idea is here that in Parkinson's disease, due to the lack of dopamine, this integration and segregation of information at the basal ganglia level is dysfunctional. It's, it's not working well. There are many electrophysiological experiments which are showing this. And if I may show you this sketch that I modified here from a paper by Jose Obezo, if you have here different parts of the cortex corresponding to different parts of the body, they project to the basal ganglia as I showed you before in the, in the structure experiment, to a certain part, they are unique. They convey only unimodal information, but there is a certain degree of overlap. The idea here in Parkinson's disease, due to the lack of dopamine, this overlap is too much, and therefore, I'm not able to well control here flexors and extensors, and that's why I'm so stiff, because uh, muscle groups with, with different functions are working uh, at the same time. Again, this is a little bit zoomed in. Again, healthy controls, certain degree of overlap in Parkinson's disease due to the lack of dopamine, more overlap, all disorganized. And this is, again, our hypothesis. First of all, we had to master some um, technical challenges because also here the um, data is suffering from this iron content. This is the type of imaging that we do. We did beforehand uh, a, a pilot experiment to see 
if we are able to get reasonable signal from these areas of the brain, we are playing with the spatial resolution, but nevertheless you see in the basal ganglia, due to the presence of iron, we are not having so much signal there. I'm going to spare you here these details because I see you very much excited about this. And what I can show you is indeed if we look at the representation of face, arms and legs on the brain at the different uh, spatial resolutions, on the surface of the brain cortex we see something which is very nice, but actually in the basal ganglia, depending on the spatial resolution, we have different type of signal. Um, this is also something that overlaps very well with the known uh, cartography of the brain from Penfield. Again, this is no rocket science, but I think this representation of the different body parts here in the putamen, uh, which you can see maybe here from electrophysiological experiments, is very convincing. And I'm telling you that there are not that many studies around which can show with such level of, of detail activation these parts of the brain. Um, what did we do in Parkinson's disease patients? Well, we asked them to uh, perform um, either, um, um, uh, uh, um, they had to squeeze a ball or with these pedals they had to, to, to squeeze also here this ball behind, that means they had to, to, to move their legs. Everything was very carefully timed and what we did is we uh, made these experiments while they were on their dopaminergic treatment but also we asked them to come a week or two later and to leave the medication out. Of course, we split the group in two. We made on medication, off medication to the half of the group and the other half the other way around. But these are, again, details because what we wanted was actually to carefully, with this pneumatic system of squeezing and pushing the pedals, to see uh, all the details about how much they press, are we not getting a bias from the fact that they are Parkinson's disease if we compare them to, to healthy controls. That means we had a very sophisticated system of automatically detecting at each moment how fast they press, either here with the hand or with the feet, how fast they release the ball, um, how much force were there, etc. Then we used a certain uh, nice way how we can actually um, determine this index of segregation or integration of information. Again, I'm not going to go through it because time is really advancing. And actually what we see in this very busy slide is something what A confirms our hypothesis. Indeed, there is a problem of segregation of information. It was very clearly lateralized because I was telling you again or reminding you that Parkinson's disease is asymmetric. It begins either on the right, on the left, and all our findings were actually confined to the part of the brain which was contralateral to the affected size, which is exactly the part of the brain which controls this abnormal sign. And we see very nice correlations here between this loss of segregation and the symptom severity. That means we claim here that we can indeed have a functional biomarker which is predictive for the clinical symptom severity. So far so good. Then we were doing some other experiments. I'll drop here the explanation. And here to convince you that everything comes back to the, to the same point, we don't want just to produce one study after the other, we want to combine all these hypotheses and notions that we had before. And here this um, idea of segregation integration at the structural level, what I presented before, we tested this also in our cohort of Parkinson's patients. You see here the basal ganglia, again this part which is more to the back is projecting to the motor parts of the cortex, here the red one, these are the 
the, the motivational, the limbic part, and here the green one is the cognitive, the intellectual part, let's say, of the, of the brain. And we were trying also to segregate the patients in different subtypes. I was talking beforehand about this akinetic or rigid patients or the others which are more tremulous. We also uh, managed based on their behavioral performance to see some of them which were more depressed, some of them were demented, and we segregated this in subgroups to see how this connectivity is linked to their symptoms. Here the idea is very clear. If there is absolute segregation between the cortex and the basal ganglia, we'll be keeping, let's say, this type of colors. If there will be integration with absolute, let's say, convergence and divergence of information, we color coded um, the voxels in that way. And just to show you here briefly, when we look at the difference between healthy controls and Parkinson's patients affected more on the left, on the right, we see more or less a similar picture, but if we split then, let's say, the connectivity in the different modes and the different types of, of, of associ associative limbic sensory motor uh, circuits, we see clearly a difference also of connectivity, loss of segregation I at the level of the basal ganglion Parkinson's disease patients. And even more convincing, I think, when we looked at these other behavioral components, uh, the more uh, dementia type or the more depressive type, we see also that the subgroups of Parkinson's patients also differ in between uh, in terms of structural segregation at the basal ganglia level. Good. That was so far so good. I told you that I'm going to talk very briefly about the medical informatics platform. It's Farad uh, Kerif uh, who will be extending on this uh, tomorrow, just wanted to give you a glimpse about um, this. Again, the concept is the same, what I introduced before. The type of information that is provided now is restricted to structural imaging, but again, the idea is, of course, to expand also to functional imaging. Here on the structural side, we have here some MRI data, which, of course, is not um, um, uh, going to put up any uh, data protection or other regulations. And this type of information is either presented as a global metric, that means we have estimated already for you people who, for example, don't want to bother with such techniques, which are number crunching MRI data. That means we can present one number per brain, 1.5, uh, liters, my brain, your brain, 1.6 liters, and so on. Then we are providing some regional information for all the different here regions, cognitive, limbic, etc., etc. You can have one number, and the goal is also soon to provide rich information also at the voxel level. And um, this is the concept of data factory. And of course, the most important part is that you can use also online tools for statistics, which are summarized in this algorithm factory. Here we have the concept about biological signatures of disease. To make, again, this very simple, I would say, I was listening to, 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 to the speaker beforehand, and he was claiming that animal models are not good, and so on and so on. He's completely right. I was mentioning to you before that I think we doctors failed massively in this uh, endeavor. Why? Because I think the problem is whatever smart drugs you develop, if you cannot say this subject or this individual or this patient has disease A or B, whatever you have developed, if the clinician is wrong with his diagnosis, then the drugs will, will not help, obviously. That means we failed to really pinpoint the exact diagnosis uh, uh, on, 
particular neurodegenerative disorders. What is the problem? The problem is that all these descriptions of diseases, they stem from previous times. A very smart French or British neurologist was sitting somewhere, seeing one, two, three, four, five uh, patients with a similar, uh, let's say, uh, symptomatology, and saying, okay, this will be the disease of Ragansky. But this was based purely on phenomenology. Nowadays, we have so much evidence from genetics and, and other type of information that this is not true. Similar phenotypes actually have absolutely different genotype and vice versa. Uh, that means we are failing to show which are the individuals, which is the homogeneous group of individuals which will benefit from one or another drug. That means the failure is not only on the drugs uh, produ production side, but also on clinician side, not being able really to define a biologically meaningful entity which will be saying, okay, here we have a problem of this pathway, here we have a problem of that. And this is exactly the idea here, what um, Ferrat will present you tomorrow. I wanted just to mention briefly something because I was browsing today through open data sources like ADNI, PPMI, but also own data from our research lab. Well, that's the problem. Actually, in the medical informatics platform, we try to use data which is already available in hospitals. Uh, you go around the corner, Medical University Innsbruck, huge, many, many patients, many, many, many thousands of scans, blood works, and so on. What happens with this data? They are stored after the, the, the data was acquired just for diagnostic purposes, and no one is, is using it. Eventually, if it's a chronic disease, somebody will look what was 10 years ago, but that's all. And the idea is indeed to make use of this rich information, again, without perturbing any data protection and other uh, sensitive um, uh, domains. But the problem is that clinical data is not well organized. I mean, it's not a research database where I have an Excel spreadsheet or whatever for all participants. I have all the data. There are a lot of missing data. Uh, technician was tired and acquired just half of the brain and so on and so on, right? That means our idea is indeed to merge this information from uh, well-organized research databases uh, with existing clin clinical data and inform the two um, um, about these biological signatures of disease. And I think I'll jump over something because I'm sure that you're very much motivated to hear more, but I live in Switzerland and we love to be on time and now it's 7.30 and I have to stop. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm open for some questions. Thank you.